Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to call this meeting to order of the Mayor and Commissioners for Tuesday, February 23rd, 2016. Will you please rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> If you would bow your heads with me for a brief prayer, please. Father God, I come to you on behalf of the town of Rising Sun tonight. I ask that you please continue to watch over our community and these elected body members that are here this evening. I also ask God that you continue to protect our police and our fire department and be with the families of Pat Daly and Mark Logston who were laid to rest this past year, this past uh, week. I ask that uh, God looks over all of our um, police department, the Rising Sun Police Department and our chief and continue to guide them in a Christ-like way. In Jesus' name, amen. First on the agenda is approval of minutes from the January 12th, 2016 meeting. Could I get a motion to approve? I'll make a motion. Second. Second. Brian got you. Yeah. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Next is uh, public presentations. And first on the list is roll call. Oh, roll call. If, if you'd like, Mayor, just make a motion, just entertain a motion that all... Uh, all members are present. Could I get a motion to approve that? Second. Or so moved. Second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Town Administrator. Ma'am, thank you so much. Now you need to go over to the mic. It's the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. This is Miss Sandy Baldino. No, it is not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hi, I'm Sandy. hi, Sandy. Well, welcome. <laughs> yes. Hi, hi. Lois. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, we are both American Cancer Society volunteers, and we have close connection with this town because in 2004 we were co-chairs of Daffodil Days for the American Cancer Society, and we visited every business in this town and in the surrounding area, um, and since then. Even though the American Cancer Society uh, ended their uh, nationwide daffodil days, we kept them alive thanks to Marcy Busman at Sun Pharmacy. Every year she takes orders for daffodils, and we deliver them here. And um, they go to the American Can the proceeds still go to the American Cancer Society. So that's our, my background. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm Sandy lives out on Karen Drive in Rising Sun. So she's the one who brought me to this fine town. Um, the reason we're here tonight is about Relay for Life. Uh, over 30 years ago, one man started uh, to call attention to cancer and to raise some funds. He was out in the Northwest. He was an oncologist. And he walked around a track for 24 hours by himself uh, to raise money. Now. 30 plus years later, it's an international event and the largest fundraising event for the American Cancer Society. This county has had a Relay for Life for, uh, it'll be 20 years, this May 20th. And the mayor of Elkton has issued a challenge to all of the mayors in the county to establish a team a team, you can't be a team of one, <laughs> uh, to uh, come to the, this 20th celebration. Is there anybody in here who has no idea what a Relay for Life is? Because I've got to give you just a nutshell. My husband says I talk too much, but <laughs> whatever. <coughs> um, teams come together on a night after they've done some fundraising, and they spend the night <coughs> camped out all night long. And it's a night of, of celebration, it is a night of remembrance, and it's a night of commitment to continue the work until we defeat this disease. This year the uh, theme is Paint the World Purple because purple is the uh, color of survivorship. And over the 20 years that, El that Cecil County has had a relay, the number of su survivors has greatly increased and we're so proud of that. Uh, I have one or two sheets to show you what the money does in Maryland. 
uh, that I will leave here, as well as some posters that I'm hoping people will help me post throughout the town. But the reason it's an overnight event is because cancer doesn't sleep. And Gordy, Dr. Gordy, who started this event, walked all night long and talked about how, uh, you know, in the gloom of the night, a cancer patient has to deal with all of their fears as well as their families. Uh, cancer doesn't just strike one person. It's estimated that at least nine people in a family are affected when someone is diagnosed with cancer. So our teams don't run, but they walk the track all night long. Uh, it's, it is expected that each team, a minimum of eight people, uh, will have somebody on that track all night long. And um, in addition to that, um, we start off each event by having our invited guests, who are the survivors in our county, come and be recognized for their years of survivorship and be entertained with a dinner and other entertainment. And then <coughs> the general population starts walking the track throughout the night so that nobody has a real excuse for sleeping. Uh, there are activities uh, as the night progresses. One of the most poignant um, memories that I have from Relay is each and every luminary ceremony. One of the uh, things that uh, our teams will do, we'll have <coughs> luminary candles th uh, around the track that honor survivors and remember those who lost their battle. And at 9 o'clock, no, it's, it's 8.45 this year because we were uh, a little bit earlier the, in the year, um, the bagpiper will appear and a very solemn uh, lapse around the track will occur as there's silence and all of the games and stuff <coughs> end, and people take that opportunity to remember. Um, then the fun begins again. And there are crazy things uh, to keep the young and old engaged all night long. <coughs> so if you've never been to a relay, this is definitely one to come to. If you uh, have just a little bit of inkling that you'd like to come and, and join, a form a team or join a team, we encourage you to do so. Uh, some of your money goes towards a telephone line that is open 24-7. Uh, and when you dial that, that number, 1-800-ACS-2345, you get a person. And that person is there to talk to people who can't sleep because they're worried, who need to find out if there's a, a, another treatment that they've missed for their loved one, uh, to find out how to deal with their finances. All of these <coughs> calls will be directed by a person. And as I said, it's open 24-7. Some of our money that we raise here in Cecil County goes to fund that, uh, that uh, program. Uh, also, if we are very lucky that in Baltimore, there is a Hope Lodge. And Hope Lodge provides housing for people who are coming more than 45 miles away uh, to get treatment in Baltimore. And so they won't have to make a commute back and forth, and it's free. And it not only houses uh, a patient who might be getting uh, outpatient <coughs> services over a period of, of weeks, but it also provides uh, room and board for their caregiver. And our money goes to help support that as well as research and education. And I, I know, I, I'm going to cut it short because I could go on and on. I truly believe in the American Cancer Society. Um, cancer, I'm not a survivor. I have grandchildren. And I don't want them to have to face this dread disease as they grow up. So I'm working as hard as I can to, to try to raise awareness and some funds and get more people involved in our community um, especially from Rising Sun, because you've got a great history of support. Um, and I'm here to answer questions. I'm going to leave some flyers and some posters. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm? <coughs> oh, oh, yes. Oh, and Palm Sunday, um, Chalamaya Church. Uh, has a Sunday of Hope service. Um, they, too, 
are involved and have been involved with daffodils every uh, year since 2004. And each and every year they have uh, their lovely flowers blooming in the sanctuary and they have a garden of hope outside the church um, that uh, is a memory garden and a hope garden for cancer patients. So that's something to check out too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the Journal of Pediatrics did a survey and they found that 1.69 million American children are living in homes with loaded unlocked firearms. The CDC also did a survey and they found that 62, the average of 62 children per year are killed, I'm sorry, they, the survey indicated that uh, approximately 62 children under the age of 14 are accidentally killed each year by unlocked firearms. Um, the Rising Sun Police Department participates in a gun safety program. Um, when troop, almost said the wrong words, when Officer Herbert became a part of the Rising Sun Police Department, he took it as a pet peeve to bring in a gun safety program. Since that time, we've been able to distribute more gun safety locks than any other agency in the county. In fact, we've gone to other agencies to get more. Um, as a result, Senator Wayne Norman's office noticed and the uh, Maryland Senate wanted to recognize um, Officer Dallas Herbert for his involvement with the program. So Dallas, can you step up here for me, please? <clears throat> the award reads, official citation, be it here known to all that sincerest congratulations are offered to PFC Dallas Herbert, police officer, Rising Sun, Maryland, in recognition of your dedication to the project Safe, Tra Safe Child presented on this fourth day of February 2016 by Senator Wayne Norman. Um, Senator Norman is not available to be here tonight, but he wanted me to pass on his uh, words of encouragement and his thank yous to uh, um, Officer Herbert. I've, I've got to admit, I, I did a little cruel joke to Dallas just now. Um, as a police officer, when the boss calls you in and not tell you what's going on, <laughs> it's unnerving. I sent him a message saying, have Dallas come to the third floor ASAP. I just pointed to a seat to take the seat, and he's been sitting there waiting. <laughs> so uh, my, my apologies. Hey, Chief, didn't you also say you're going to do a taser demo? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of the elected body we want to say a sincere congratulations to dallas thank you so much Absolutely. for all you've done for uh this town and for our community um, i want to thank you guys thank you. keep up the good work thanks for everything dallas <laughs> That's pretty good. I could tell by his face. Yeah. I could tell by his face. Town administrator. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, as we've all talked about, we have a lot of information to cover here, and it's pretty comprehensive, and I'm going to try to um, put it in a manner that makes it a little bit easier for everyone to follow. Again, I apologize, the computer is running a little bit, a little bit slow. So um, it's, I will get the resolutions and ordinances up on the board as we deal with them so people can follow along. But the first thing for the elected body is for our discussion going forward here, you have eight <coughs> documents that I'm going to be referring to. First, you should have Resolution 2016-02, 2016-03, 2016-04, 2016-05, 2016-06, 2016-07, 2016-08, 2016-09, 2016-10, 2016-11, 2016-12, 2016-13, 2016-14, 2016-15, 2016-16, 2016-17, 2016-18
Resolution 2016-04. Then you should have a document that says 2016 Town of Rising Sun fee schedule. Then you should have Ordinance 2016-01, Ordinance 2016-02, and Ordinance 2016-03. And then you should also have uh, the fiscal policy that's in effect for the Town of Rising Sun. And you're going to be considering uh, the processing, adopting of six of those eight documents. Two of them are for clarification so you can see how they all tie together. When you look at all of these documents, um, they're broken down into uh, some general concepts. Resolution 02, 03, and 04 or all of the resolutions that you have before you tonight are in regards to making changes to the town's fee schedule, which is uh, that fourth document in the 2016 Town of Rising Sun fee schedule. And so you're going to be making changes to that. That 2016 Town of Rising Sun fee schedule in red has all of the changes that are part of the resolutions that you have before you. So I'm providing you what the finished document <coughs> will look like here. So let's, um, and, and before I go further, let me say that one of the ordinances, Ordinance 2016-02, is related also, uh, the reason for one of the resolutions is because of the ordinance that you're going to be adopting that uh, starts to clarify municipal infractions and misdemeanors. And there's a section in that ordinance that talks about penalty fees as referred uh, in the town's fee schedule. So we need to make that revision in the town fee schedule to go hand in hand with the ordinance that you're adopting. Um, again, for the benefit of everyone here, um, Resolutions are essentially items that you introduce and adopt the same night. They're usually not legally, uh, they're not laws and regulations. They're usually, um, you know, things like fee schedules, um, interim policy decisions uh, that are being made, whereas your ordinances are basically the laws of the land. So, uh, why don't I, one of the things I think that would make sense to do is get one of the easier documents out of the way. So I'm thinking that why don't we start with 2016-01, which is the ordinance regarding snow removal, because that's not really related to any of the fee stuff that we've been talking about. So if you would, jump to 2016-01, and this is an ordinance. This will be a, a law of the Town of Rising Sun. And generally what this ordinance is, is if you recall after the last snowstorm, um, we got a lot of snow. And it's not the first time we've gotten a lot of snow. And um, in our ordinance, it says that all sidewalks have to be cleared of snow within 24 hours of the last snowfall. And it's not unusual for municipalities to have that kind of language. Some will say 24, 36, 48. I actually found one community in researching this that said it had to be removed within eight hours of the snowstorm. And it didn't matter how much snow there. So what, what always happens in municipal government is that sometimes we pass laws and regulations that handcuff us to some degree. And so case in point was the last storm that we just got. You know, to go out and tell people that after uh, 18 inches of wind-driven heavy snow that they had 24 hours to get their sidewalks cleared is a little uh, uh, obsessive uh, to be doing. And a lot of times as your staff, we will make internal decisions about, and any, any community does this, of how soon you're going to go out. And we would normally have a policy on a storm like that to wait about maybe 72 hours, four days, five days before we start really getting out there and trying to push the issue to some degree. There are other areas that we will move upon right away, uh, but in, in some cases we try to prioritize that. So what this document does 
is, and let me, if you bear with me a second, let me bring this up so the audience can see it. Um, so this would be, um, and really before I read it in, uh, you guys should make a motion as to whether or not you want to have this for consideration for tonight. Can I get a motion to have this for consideration? I move that we consider Ordinance 2016-01 for consideration. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes. Continue. All right, the summary of this is this is an ordinance of the Town of Rising Sun, Cecil County, Maryland, amending the general laws of the Town of Rising Sun by amending and adding language to Chapter 3 of the Town of Rising Sun's Property Maintenance Minimum Housing and Quality of Life Code and providing for a more balanced formula for determining the time period for removal of snow, ice objects, and storm debris from sidewalks and public ways establishing proper removal methods and repealing any and all other ordinances and parts of ordinances in conflict therewith. So we've met our obligation by doing the summary here and we've talked before about not reading every letter <coughs> of the ordinance in because it can be very time consuming. So I'm going to jump down to the more critical parts because we all know the beginning is all your boilerplate language. But if you recall back in December, the town uh, passed the property maintenance code. And in that property maintenance code, it incorporated a uh, language that we already had in place about snow removal. Mm -hmm. And that snow removal language said that you had to remove that snow within 24 hours. But as a staff, um, when we circulated this to the staff, the idea, we also realized that there's other things that can be on a sidewalk that can create problems. One being storm debris, uh, where you get trees or something fall down and block the sidewalk. Should the sidewalk be cleared of those items also? And so we basically went into the snow section of the property maintenance code and reworded it to basically incorporate <coughs> storm debris or anything else that would end up on the sidewalk. And in addition to that, we tried to come up with sort of a weighted formula of how soon somebody would have to be able to do something. So let's take a look real quick at the way it is worded right now. And section 30215 of the property maintenance code titled Snow and Ice Removal Currently, it's worded that the owner of any property that abuts any sidewalk or a public highway or common alley shall remove all snow from such sidewalks within 24 hours after the final snowfall. Um, item B, snow shall be removed from all sidewalks and walking surfaces to provide a pathway of at least 36 inches. C, the owner of any property that abuts any sidewalk or public highway or common alley shall not permit ice upon which it's dangerous to travel to remain on such sidewalk. D, no owner shall permit snow or ice to conceal any fire hydrant or other fire department connections located on the property. E, no owner shall permit snow or ice to remain on any fire department access roads located on the property. And F, no person shall shovel, plow, or move snow out into the public way after it has been plowed, moved, or uh, removed unless authorized by the town. For clarification, some of the language you see in here is written for your commercial properties because, uh, you know, a lot of times we think about residential properties as the issue, but sometimes it's commercial properties. And so that's where we're talking about not allowing fire department connections and access roads on a property that were put there so that the property could operate legally, so therefore the owner is responsible for clearing those obstructions from it. So the changes that are going to be made to that same section is that section 30215 shall be modified by changing the title and deleting all of the text in notes A and C, A and C through F shall be modified to read as follows. So the new language is um, snow, ice, objects, and storm debris removal from sidewalks. All owners of buildings or land shall be responsible for the removal of any snow, ice, objects, and storm debris as follows. The owner of any property that abuts any sidewalk or public highway or common alley shall remove all storm debris as defined in Chapter 2 and any snow from such sidewalks within the time period stipulated below. 
uh, number one, objects in storm debris consisting of small items in quantities of all of the below shall be removed within 24 hours after the end of the storm. So that, that quantification is A, five feet, any item that's five feet or less in length and or five feet or less in circumference and or individual items weighing 50 pounds or less and or volumes of material weighing less than 50 pounds. So we're basically saying trees, rocks, chunks of mud, whatever, that fit within that, you gotta get them off the sidewalk within 24 hours. Item number two, <clears throat> Objects and storm debris, large items in excess of the above quantities, you would have 72 hours unless an extension of time is granted by the town. So you get a tree branch that falls across the sidewalk that's 8 inches in diameter by 20 feet long, we're going to give you 72 hours to get rid of it. You have an entire tree that falls across the public sideway, sidewalk, just communicate with us and you'll get whatever time is reasonable for getting it removed. Now with that, that doesn't mean we're going to tell you you have to take it completely out of your yard. You could just get a landscaper or somebody to cut the branches that are across the sidewalk out of the way so it's passable. We're not really going to worry about necessarily how long you take to get the entire tree out of there. So now we're going to talk about the snow. 12 inches of snow or less, uh, property owners will have 24 hours after the final snowfall as established by the town. And what that means is the town will send out a notice of when we have said the snowstorm has stopped. And so the 24-hour clock will start ticking. Um, snow greater than 12 inches and up to 18 inches, properties will have 48 hours after the final snowfall as established by the town. Item five, snow greater than 18 inches and up to 24 inches, 72 hours after the final snowfall as established by the town. Snow greater than 24 inches and up to 36 inches, 96 hours after the final snowfall as established by the town and snow greater than 36 inches, time limit is established by and posted by the town of Rising Sun. So basically what we're trying to do is be more realistic about uh, getting people to remove snow from their sidewalks. Um, and then those other items that we talked about above, the same general concepts are in there. You gotta get ice off your sidewalk. You can't uh, allow it to remain there. Um, if the street has been plowed, you should not be shoveling snow back into the sidewalk or directing your snowblower. Uh, you should not be shoveling snow from the sidewalk out into the street, and you should not be uh, with your snowblower blowing that snow out into the street. That does create a domino effect uh, down, down the road when that happens. And in most cases, people can shovel it into your yard or snow blow it into the, into the yard. The other thing that this is introducing, and this is tied to one of our ordinances, is uh, municipal infractions. And this is basically saying that this violation of uh, item F, snow, ice, objects, or storm debris removed from sidewalk areas shall be placed on the property of the owner adjacent to the removal area. Excessive amounts of snow or ice may be placed in the area between the sidewalk and the curb line, but not in the street or public way. No person shall, shall shovel snow, plow or move snow out into the public way after it has been plowed, moved or removed. Furthermore, no objects or storm debris shall be placed into the street or public way unless authorized by the town. Persons responsible for a violation of this subnote shall be deemed guilty of a Category Level 1A violation and subject to the penalty fees listed in the town's fee schedule. So again, you see why you need to address the uh, fee schedule. Um, let me just quickly say we're going to tie this loose end in later in the presentation. This Category Level A is basically saying that we're not going to give you a violation notice for doing that. If you're blowing snow out in the street, deliberately placing things out in the street that are a nuisance, you're going to get an automatic citation very similar to what the police issue for parking in a no parking zone, running a stop sign or whatever. And we'll talk about how that will be processed. But 
That in summary is ordinance 2016-01. Does anybody have any questions on that? All right, so that was the easy one. So I'm suggesting that what we do now is go back to the actual fee schedules. And the first one we can address is schedule uh, resolution 2016-02. And what this essentially is, is um, in our existing fee schedule, we have a section, and this was passed a couple years ago, regarding the abatement of nuisances. In other words, if the town has to go out and remove snow or cut grass or remove debris or do anything <coughs> because the property owner refuses to do it, we're not looking to do that as a cost savings for the property. We're not looking at this as being a good neighbor necessarily going out and taking care of the responsibility. So in the fee schedule, there are some, some rather legitimate fees associated with the removal of snow. For instance, we just removed, I think, about 15 properties of snow, and the average price was about 225 for each one of those there, and we will be issuing uh, invoices for those properties uh, in the coming days here. So the fees are high because the property owner has refused to deal with it. Um, so in this resolution here, one of the things we realize we do not have is the administrative handling and processing of these items and then late penalty fees for not paying it. Now, what do I mean by that? If you remember, we just um, introduced for tax sale properties, properties that had not paid their taxes, but we are also permitted by law to send properties to tax sale if they don't pay for these types of abatement fees. But somebody could get a, an abatement fee in January and sit on it through the entire 12-month calendar year with no penalty or late penalty fee for having it sit there. And in the meantime, you have your staff sending out notices and processing that and trying to get people to pay the money. There's a cost associated with that. And we're going to talk about this in one of the other documents. Our town charter is very clear and in the charter about talking about the elected body being able to assess late fees for anything that's due to the town of Rising Sun. And right now, we don't do that. And we're not proposing to do that for everything, but we are proposing to do it when it comes to us having to redirect Public Works employees to go take care of a vacant property that a bank doesn't want to cut the grass or remove the snow. So this resolution here will um, talk about that. If, you, um, if this is something you're interested in, if you give a motion, we can read the resolution in. Can I get a motion to read the resolution okay. into the record? So move. Second. Resolution 2000. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I'm ready to go. 2016-02. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Continue. 2016-02. Fee schedule amendment. Town charges for emergency measures and abatement cleanup services for properties in violation of the property maintenance, minimum housing and quality of life codes. Mm -hmm. Whereas the town located in Cecil County, Maryland is a municipality organized under and governed by Article 23A of the Annotated Code of Maryland. And whereas the town is proclaimed as a perpetual entity with the right to pass laws. And whereas the town's codes to include the town's property maintenance minimum housing and quality of life code provides for the abatement of any violations found to exist on a property and to charge all related fees for these services upon the person responsible for the violation and or owner, occupant, or operator of the premise or property where the abatement services were taken. And whereas the current fee schedule already provides for such abatement service fees, and whereas the married commissioners feel that these charges listed should be modified 
modified and amended to more closely mirror the language and intent set forth in these codes to more accurately define what charges and services will be assessed to the responsible person. Therefore, be it enacted and resolved that the mayor and commissioners of the town of Rising Sun are modifying the cleanup and abatement services fees section of the town of Rising Sun fee schedule by changing the title to read emergency measures and abatement cleanup services while also adding a new subsection E in order to provide a discount. I'm sorry, that's a mistake in here. And a subsection E uh, in order to provide for administrative processing and third party contractor late fees and failure to pay. So that's an amendment um, that I'm putting in there. That, uh, it's a typo here. And so that section would go on to read as follows. Administrative processing, third party contract, or late fees and failure to pay. Subsection 1, administrative handling and processing, 10% of the total cost. Late fees for non payment, 10% reoccurring monthly late fee on unpaid balances. Now, th now, therefore, be it further resolved that the mayor and commissioners of the town of Rising Sun pass approved and adopted this resolution on the 23rd day of February 2016. <clears throat> I make a motion we adopt resolution 2016-02. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, the next item is resolution 2016-03. Let me see if I can get this one. Um, this is um, establishing of municipal infraction penalty ticket fee amounts. This will make more sense when we go over the resolution or the ordinance regarding that. But basically, this is allowing the um, fee schedule to um, allow you guys to put penalty fees associated whenever a, a um, municipal infraction ticket is issued to somebody. And so um, the fee schedule um, will reflect the five categories of uh, municipal infractions here. And if you would, maybe it would make sense to jump to ordinance, the ordinance related to this so it sort of makes sense yeah. here so there isn't some uh, confusion. And that ordinance is going to be... Um, ordinance 2016 02. Uh, currently in the town code, there is uh, chapter one, and chapter one of the town code titled General Provisions contains article two. Uh, title penalties designated and currently right now that section basically says that all violations of our town codes are misdemeanors and so if you look at jumping ahead to what that means it what that says is unless otherwise provided in these ordinances any person found guilty of, of violating any provision of this code for which a violation is a misdemeanor as described in section 1-401 shall be subject to a fine not to exceed $1,000 and imprisonment not to exceed 90 days or both such fine and imprisonment for each offense. Each day a violation continues shall unless otherwise provided constitute a separate or repeated offense. So that basically means in reality if somebody doesn't cut the grass and they, you take them to court hypothetically, the judge could say, you're going to jail for failing to cut your grass. And that's one of those things where you have an ordinance that's been on the books for years. It's not uncommon to find it in municipal ordinances. But what a lot of communities are starting to move towards is municipal infractions. And so basically, um, if you guys are comfortable in moving in the direction of the introduction of municipal infractions, uh, you can make a motion to have this read in uh, to the minutes for consideration in the future. Could I get a motion uh, to read this into the record? So move. Second. 
Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> All right, so reading the summary, ordinance number 2016-02, an ordinance of the town of Rising Sun, Cecil County, Maryland, amending the general laws of the town of Rising Sun by amending and adding language to chapter one of the code of ordinances of the town of Rising Sun and deleting and repealing certain articles and provisions in conflict therewith in order to more clearly define the classification of violations and penalty fees associated therewith and repealing any and all other ordinances and parts of the ordinances in conflict. So what this basically is telling you is that right now everything's a misdemeanor <coughs> in the town code. And what we were looking to do is to streamline the process convert certain violations, primarily property maintenance violations, into municipal infractions. And this is something that other communities do. And basically what that means is just like the police have a ticket book, um, we can issue a ticket to somebody for violations in the existing property maintenance code. But the way we're writing this ordinance is that when you make changes to the land development code, the zoning code, streets and sidewalks code, your, uh, your sewer and water codes in the future, you can decide whether or not you're going to make it a misdemeanor or a municipal infraction that can be just an automatic citation written to somebody. So um, in this ordinance here, there are definitions, and our code lacks a lot of definitions, so we've added some things in here. Um, so this basically, the codified ordinances of the town of Rising Sun, this is taken right out of the town charter about what the, the ordinances of the town of Rising Sun are, are supposed to accomplish. So there's your five items there. We have a definition on court citations, what they are. We have a definition, a state definition of what a misdemeanor is. We also have a state definition of what a municipal infraction is. And you already, um, you heard about what um, the mis misdemeanor is. A municipal infraction includes a violation of any ordinance or regulation concerning zoning or land use, littering, property maintenance, and other nuisance laws, and or regulations authorized to be adopted or enacted by the Board of Commissioners. A municipal infraction shall be a strict liability offense and deemed a civil offense. And then we introduce the idea of municipal infraction penalty tickets, uh, st what strict liability offense is, and what that means is an offense in which the prosecution at a legal proceeding is not required to prove criminal intent as part of its case. It is enough to prove that the defendant either did an act which was prohibited or failed to do an act which the defendant was legally required to do. So that's a very important thing to put in here. Violation warning notices is pretty much self-explanatory is when you're going to get a, a warning notice that you're not complying with the code. Um, so now we're back to the new definition of misdemeanors, which is essentially the same as what the previous one was, other than the state changed the definition to take it from 90 days in jail to six months in jail. So this definition is right out of the state requirements. But again, we're reserving this for your more serious things that sort of border on criminal activity. Now, your violations classified as municipal infractions. Um, again, this is where um, we're going to be able to just issue uh, citations for <clears throat> municipal infractions. Now, one of the things we've done is we've broken the municipal fra infractions down into categories. And the reason being is that if you want to enforce your property maintenance code, you clearly cannot, you can't classify all your infractions the same way. Now, what do I mean? We can condemn a building for being unfit for habitation. And if somebody just violates that and goes into a building that, let's say the fire company responded to it's damaged, we've said it's on the verge of being fallen down, and we post it, don't enter the building. Well, you're going to want to really, you know, penalize somebody pretty seriously if they just ignore that and go in there because at the end of the day, 
you're trying to stop your police department from having to go into a dangerous situation to get that person out of the building if something happens or the fire company from doing it. So you want to treat that violation differently. So you would, you would consider that a, a Category 1 violation that means we're not going to warn you and say, hey, didn't you see the sign that said you couldn't go in and you did it? You better not do that again. They're going to get a citation issued to them right on the bat. And that citation is going to be very steep, which is why you see the Category Level 1 um, uh, violation notice is broken down into an A, B, C, and D. And when you look at your fee schedule, you're going to see the fine associated with that type of violation. Now, I just gave you the extreme. If somebody doesn't cut their grass, and the grass was eight inches high, is what you're, you're allowing eight inches, you roll up, it's 12 inches, it's 14 inches, you're getting complaints from residents, do we want to just say, Mrs. Jones, you're in violation, you're getting a $25 ticket right here or now, or do you want to give Mrs. Jones a violation notice and say, hey, come on, you got to cut your grass, we're going to give you another 72 hours to cut your grass. If you don't, then you're going to get that municipal um, infraction, and that's where you had the category 2, 3, 4, and 5. Because, and the reason for, for the diversity is that category 1, they're going to get no warning. It's They've done it. They blew snow back out into the streets. They uh, pulled out of a job site and tracked mud down the street and blew mud all over the place. That's those types of violations are really considered obnoxious. They, why did you do that? You did it because you were too lazy to clear the mud off the tires. So we're looking at that as very egregious and offensive to our community. So they're going to be level one violations and then broken down into the, to the severity. Your things where you want to give somebody the opportunity to comply, and there, if you look there on item B, um, for the board's case, I'm looking at section 1-204, item B, category level 2, 3, 4, and 5 municipal infractions. Some acts of noncompliance are considered to be offensive to the town in nature and potentially hazardous if not corrected in a timely manner. However, it is the intent of this code to afford the person responsible for these types of violations and or the owner, occupant, or operator of the premise determined to be in violation, ample time to correct and remedy the violation and avoid the assessment of penalties. Therefore, a violation warning notice would be issued in accordance to section 1-205 and the, uh, to the person responsible, and that would outline what you've done wrong and how, uh, how much time you have to correct it. So let's back up to one item above, A, and look at category level one municipal infractions to put it in context. Some acts of noncompliance that result in violations of the town code, ordinance, or laws are deemed to be contemptible, self-serving in nature, likely, likely performed to abrogate further responsibility and lacking any regard to others or the community. These violations are considered a nuisance requiring immediate attention or harmful to neighboring properties, public highways, utilities, and infrastructure. In some cases, the acts of noncompliance rise to a level of irresponsibility and total disregard for personal safety or the safety of others. As such, the Board of Commissioners have determined that no prior violation warning notice outlining abatement or correction of the violation is needed prior to the issuance of the penalties or fines to the persons responsible. So in short, it's basically saying it's really pretty obnoxious what you're doing. And so we're just going to give you a straight violation, again, broken down into the various categories. So in a nutshell, that's what this ordinance is doing. It's, it's providing the legal language to continue to have misdemeanors. It's creating the municipal infractions. But just like our snow removal ordinance where, you know, you can't tell somebody to get 36 inches of snow off the sidewalk in 24 hours, we're trying to be more uh, responsive in the way we're dealing with these things. So it's broken down into these subcategories. In here, it's going to hold the town accountable to things too, because we're going to have a written document or rules on how we issue a violation notice. And by law, and the chief can attest to this, 
called due process. And so when you go into court, the judge is going to make, want to make sure that the person you issued a violation notice to had ample warning to be able to resolve it. So just like uh, what you have to do on the criminal side to some degree, you know, we're, we're going to start documenting how those violations, what those violation notices need to look like. It needs to tell you what the penalty is going to be, and it needs to allow you to have the, the voice to say, I don't agree with this, I think the code officer is wrong in what they're doing, and go before a, an appeals board to appeal that the application of the code is not warranted here. So we're, we're putting due process into this, which is not in our codes right now. We're going to talk about the method of service. You know, how are we getting at the people to make sure that we've done our due diligence to make sure that they knew what uh, the issues were. So um, that, you know, basically is, is uh, the way we're doing this. Um, another stickler here, which is consistent with what other communities do, is when you get a municipal infraction, and if you get, and I think our lowest penalty might be $35, you're going to have 20 days to pay that $35 to the town. If you don't do that, we're going to send you a warning notice saying that you have not paid that. If you don't pay it, we're going to automatically double that penalty fee. So now your $35 goes to 70 And if you don't pay it after that, we're going to issue a court citation. Now it's going to turn into a misdemeanor, and you're going to go before court if you're going to be that defiant and not take responsibility for your violation. The alternative is, if you get that municipal infraction and you don't, you don't want to pay the fine because you don't think it's justifiable, your recourse is to say, I want to go to district court and argue before a judge that I shouldn't have to pay this. And so that sort of stays the payment of the fine and allows you to go to a judge and argue that you should not have had to pay that. So this is all consistent with, um, you know, being more realistic in the way other municipalities, more progressive municipalities deal with it. So that, in a, you know, in, a, in, in a, a rather lengthy summary is that. So I think that we go, I think the best thing would be to go back to resolution 2016-03. Um, and again, um, that is, if you scroll down to the, uh, the bottom of the first page, now you see those category levels and what those fines are. So in the future, if you determine that a violation in the property maintenance code needs to be handled differently from a penalty standpoint, you can either change the classification of the violation as it will be listed in the property maintenance code. In other words, it will say, failure to cut your grass will be considered a category level two violation. You would go to the fee schedule and see that a category level two is a $35 fine. Um, you know, going in a, a building that's been marked unfit for habitation, that's most likely going to be a category level 1D, and you see where well, that fine is automatic $100. You don't get a warning notice on it. So that, that's how those two marry together. So that concludes the report for that resolution, which you can adopt tonight if you would like. Would anyone like to make a motion to adopt that resolution? I'll, I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 2016-03. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Only discussion that I think I would add is that um, I was amazed to find out that we could actually send people to jail for not cutting their grass. Well, I just thought it was ironic that yeah. you haven't cut your grass, so we're going to send you to jail for 90 days where your grass won't be cut. Yeah, yeah, I, def <laughs> yeah. yeah. I definitely um, I definitely think that's something that um, I'm glad to see that we're and changing. We find them when they get out um, of jail. Especially because we've had conversations before about having to give this to the state's attorney and expecting yeah. him to go and enforce when he has so many other important things potentially to do yeah. to have to go and potentially put someone in jail for not cutting their grass or not removing their, their snow. Yes. It's just not. Um, with that, any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. Thank you. Um, the next one there in Board of Commissioners is Resolution 2016-04. This is the easiest of all of them. 
It ties together with your document that I gave you, the 2016 Town of Rising Sun fee schedule, in that um, currently in our fee schedule, there are no category references or at no way to cite a particular section. In other words, if you want to send a letter to somebody saying this is a violation that carries a fine of whatever, in accordance to the fee schedule, there's no way to reference that. And so if, for instance, and I apologize to the audience, I thought I had put a copy of the fee schedule up there, but I'm not seeing it here. Basically, on the first page, you see in red section one under zoning compliance permits. And what I'm saying is the existing fee schedule didn't have section one there. It just had compliance zoning compliance permit, so it made it difficult to tell somebody where to find something in the fee schedule. So that's all this is, is creating uh, chapter headings and, and numbers for people to be able to reference. Um, if you're satisfied with that, we can read that resolution into the minutes. I get a motion to continue with reading in resolution 2016-04. So moved. Second. We moved and second at all in favor. Aye. 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 Calvin, you, you said 04 goes with our the fee schedule document that we have. I'm sorry, what's that? 2016-04 goes with our fee schedule document that was in our packet? Yes. Okay. Yes. I want to make sure I got all my documents together. Um, the, the fee schedule you have is already in existence. You're just making changes to the way it's formatted so it's easier to read. Okay. Is this the new one or the old one that we have? This is the old one with the new changes of these resolutions incorporated into it already. Because okay. I don't think all of ours got copied in with the red highlights. Yeah, I, when you, when you um, held yours up, I could see it's not yeah. in red there. Right. So black and white save money. So um, all right, so let me bring this up for the audience here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Town of Rising Sun Resolution 2016-04, fee <clears throat> schedule amendment, reformatting of town fee schedule, whereas the town located in Cecil County, Maryland, is a municipality organized under and governed by Article 23A <laughs> of the Annotated Code of Maryland, and whereas the town is proclaimed as a perpetual entity with the right to pass laws, and whereas the town's fee schedule has evolved over the years and is in need of some minor structural formatting to avoid confusion and approve readability, uh, uh, actually that should be improved readability of the document. Therefore, being enacted and resolved that the mayor and commissioners of the town of Rising Sun are hereby creating and adding section numbers for each of the primary headings of the fee schedule as follows. Section 1, zoning compliance permits. permits. Section 2, building permit fees. Section 3, fire code plan review and inspection fees. Section 4, other construction fees. Section 5, annexation, land development and zoning fees. Section 6, administrative fees. Section 7, emergency measures and abatement cleanup and services. Section 8, business sponsorship banners. Section 9, municipal infractions penalty ticket fees. I move okay. that we approve resolution 2016-04. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. Thank you. All right, the last um, ordinance that you have, and again, this, if, if it's suitable, this would be presented tonight for consideration. And this a portion of this document references the fiscal policy, which is that uh, tenth document that I said you're not voting on. It's just for reference for you. Um, when, when we were looking at all these ordinances and really getting involved and seeing the way our town codes are structured and then looking at the way other communities are doing it, a glaring weakness in our town code is the way we do our finances in general. In other words, um, yeah, we, we approve the budget before the end of the fiscal year, but all it says is that we will approve a budget. It doesn't say if it's being done by resolution, ordinance, or whatever. And uh, there's a lot of detail 
that we take <laughs> for granted that's been handed down from generation to generation on how to do our finances, but it's not it's not codified anywhere. And uh, you know, it's time to bring that up to code. So a lot of the stuff you're going to see in here is an attempt to take what's in our charter, some ideas from other communities, and marry it to the way this town historically has done its processes here. Um, so let me bring that up for everyone. And basically the title of this one, and I'm going to jump down to the title, is um, it's a revision of Chapter 9 of our existing uh, town code. Uh, and actually, th this ordinance is going to change two chapters in our town codes. It's going to change Chapter 9, and it's going to change, um, it's going to make a change to Chapter 4, because Chapter 4 has some financial stuff that if we want to get all this financial stuff in one location, it makes sense to move it out of Chapter 4 and move it into this revised Chapter 9. So what I'm going to do first is show you um, the title here, and then the existing articles, um, all the existing language contained in this newly titled chapter will remain the same. However, the articles, although having the same titles, will be assigned new numbers, starting with Article 1, titled Licenses, Article 2, Amusements and Street Vendors, and Article 3, titled Penalty. Now, what I'm basically saying there is our whole financial section had nothing regarding the way we do business. So we're not, gonna, we're not proposing to change the licensing language. We're not proposing to change amusement and street vendors. And we're not proposing to change the penalties. We're just looking to move them to the back of the document so we need to give them new uh, article numbers for that purpose. So in looking at the new language that we're adding, there's basically, um, I think, 11 or 12 articles being introduced here. Um, article 1 is fiscal year, annual budget, and financial reporting. So basically what you have here is we are making it known what the fiscal year of the town of Rising Sun is, which is the first day of July of a calendar year <coughs> and end on the last day of June of the next calendar year. Uh, we're talking about when we need to get the budget submitted to start focusing the elected body and the staff into a, a timeline to get the budget finished. And hopefully we don't have the type of distractions and things that have happened in the past that have had us backing the budget all the way up uh, to the tail end. Um, approval of the annual budget. Um, this talks about when the annual budget will be approved. You see uh, the last sentence, the budget resolution shall include the following information. So. It's only the last three years that we've actually been using a budget resolution. When I first came here, it was just somebody make a motion to approve the budget, and that was it. Um, a budget resolution basically takes, and over the last couple of years you've seen it, it takes basically um, what you decided to do, breaks it down into small pieces, and then you incorporate that into uh, the actual resolution. So what I'm going to show you here is the resolution that was passed last year for this past <coughs> So basically what we're writing in the ordinance is that we're going to do this exactly the way we're showing it here which basically talks about the powers of the, the elected body to create the budget. You have a line item here that says the primary governmental has a balanced budget with a small surplus projected in the general, the government fund of $14,899. And then it talks about the surplus in the proprietary fund. And then it's going to go on to talk about some of the, the, the rates that are being set. So this is where your real estate tax is going to be listed, your 2% uh, discount for paying your taxes on time, um, your personal property tax, your sewer rates, your water rates, 
and then your down at item number six, you see the current ser service charge for uh, trash collection. So that is what a budget resolution is. We're going to make it official going forward that we always adopt a budget resolution. So that's what this um, new chapter nine is going to do. And so you're seeing items A through H are telling you exactly what is already in that document here. Um, it's also going to say that we're going to provide monthly financial reporting. Um, I used to hear stories when I first came here that the elected body might get an up-to-date financial reporting maybe twice a year. As you've seen over the last couple of years, we've tried to do a monthly financial report every month. Um, we build in a little bit of time delay here because sometimes there are reasons why we can't do the monthly financial report, typically when the auditor is coming in, because um, the end of the month, our accountant does the financial reporting based upon reconciliation of everything. And so at the end of May, she'll give you a report as we have it. But at the end of June, that report might change because when the auditor comes in to do the audit, they have the power and authority to say, no, we don't want that in that budget year. We want it in the next budget year. And so we don't want to be issuing out a monthly financial report for June on July 1st, only to have the auditor come back and change it, and now you've got uh, conflicting documents. So we're basically trying to build in, you know, 60-day lag time, although, as you've seen, we do it pretty faithfully every month. Um, and then we're going to talk about what that financial report can be. Again, when I first came here as a budget example, um, I, was, oh, I, was, I was handed the budget, which was basically a, a four-page document that to some degree said, this is what we budgeted last year. We're going to inflate everything by 5%, and that's what our budget is going to be. And you've seen that we've changed that drastically the way we do that. So in the same token, our monthly financial reporting is going to have all the information you need, not just, hey, we've got $20,000 in this checking account and, you know, 100000 in the other. You're going to get all that information that you become accustomed to getting. Um, the annual report, um, this is where it talk. this is basically the audit process here, and that your staff is obligated to provide you and the residents with audited financial records here. And so that's basically clarifying and putting it into code that that's what's going to happen. And then we have items here about investment, financing, and debt policy. <coughs> we get asked every year by the state, what is your debt policy? And this is something that the state could crack down a little bit more than they do, but they basically let some, including the town of Rising Sun, have a very, you know, a debt policy. You know, I don't have anything to give to them. Now we're going to create documentation that gives more integrity to what we're doing by saying we are going to develop a debt policy that we can give to the state every year. Right now, we fill out a form that's, you know, I forget what it is, but we <coughs> basically fill out a form that says we are complying with the state law. We don't have a, that's not a policy that we adopt. So, um, we also have language in here that's taken out of our charter that um, talks about us having the ability to, instead of us investing our money in stocks and bonds and all the creative ways you can do it, you're familiar with MLGIP, where the, that's a state law that allows municipalities to invest their funds in MLGIP. So we're just putting it in the document here to make it clear. Um, we need, an, we need an investment policy, which would basically mean we're going to take all our investments and put them in MLGIP, but we're not obligated to do MLGIP. So this language is in here. If you ever wanted to deviate from MLGIP, you could create an investment policy. Um, and then there's talking about how you change those things. There's um, financing stuff in here that comes right out of our um, right out of our, ch our charter. And here's another interesting thing, um, and this is something that I've always tried to do for elected officials. 
the charter can be something that can be buried somewhere that you're not familiar with. And I always look at the town ordinances as being basically municipal government uh, made easy. It's cliff notes, so to speak, of what you should be doing and not. And so anybody who's interested for running for office now can look at our town ordinances and get more than just you have to cut your grass, you have to move your snow. This becomes a really good educational tool for elected officials and residents. So as a result of that, we want to pull certain things that are buried in the charter, such as how does the town, where does the town get its authority to assess real estate taxes, personal property taxes, impact fees. We have impact fees in the town of Rising Sun, but our charter is silent on the adoption of that. The state law allows us to do it, which is great. We don't have to put anything in here, but as I just said, if we don't create sort of a catch-all rule book, everybody's at the mercy of, well, what state law would that necessarily be in? So we're trying to collect all that and put it into this type of document. So um, how do you collect your taxes? How, why do we have the authority to send properties to tax sale? By state law we can, but we're getting this documentation in our town, fee, uh, in this document here. So here you see impact fees, um, you also see transfer of property. This is another Achilles heel for the town, is that when somebody sells a property and they're going to the settlement table, they have to stamp the deed. And in other words, if you've ever gone to settlement table, you can't buy that house or sell your house if the deed has not been stamped. But we don't have any sort of guidelines here on what is involved in stamping that deed. So for instance, we had some properties that um, we sent the tax sale or didn't send the tax sale that had some items that should have been, that should not have been able, the houses should not have been able to be sold because we stamped the deed without collecting those outstanding monies for property maintenance abatement. That happens because we don't have any clear guideline on that and it gets lost. So again, we're incorporating that into the document here. Um, establishment of fees. Um, we have a fee schedule, but there's nothing in our town code that says that you guys have the authority to create the fee schedule here. So that's in here. Um, cost for services. When you have a house that's falling over, a building that needs to be condemned or something, you need to have language that gives you the legal right to go in and take the abatement, to either tear the property down, take possession of the property, do something from an emergency standpoint. It's understood in municipal law and in the court system that you can do that, but it's not clearly articulated in our codes. Um, Article 8 is non-payment, collection and tax sale. This is where we're talking about being able to take properties to tax sale to streamline that and get it organized. Fiscal policy, this goes to that fiscal policy document that you have. When we went through some major auditing issues a couple of years ago, one of the things we got flagged on was not having a fiscal policy. And a fiscal policy has a lot of things in it, one being what has to go out to bid, how many prices do you have to get, who's approving things, the bank accounts, you always see us pass resolutions. Um, but we don't have any ordinance in here that says that we should be creating a fiscal policy. So just like has happened in the past, faces can change, you can get new people in positions, and the next thing you know, we're getting into trouble because we failed to update or to have that fiscal policy. So again, we're putting that document in here. And then item number, um, the other section that I was telling you about is in chapter two of the town code, I pre previously said four, in chapter two, there's the talk about the salary of the mayor and the salary of the commissioners. And this is something that's set by resolution. If you recall, we just recently passed a resolution creating a flat amount for the newly elected officials, um, the 
three um, in, uh, incumbents, so to speak, as of July, they will finish out their terms under this language that's in here. So one of the things we're doing here is taking what the compensation for the mayor and commissioners is out of that chapter two hanging by itself and put it in the uh, fis fiscal or the financial section of the town code. So I told you this was a lot of information to process and digest. It doesn't help that we had to cancel three town meetings. Some of this stuff, you know, was set to be introduced previously. But as you can see, a lot of this all ties together and it's about really being more transparent <clears throat> and more professional in the way we conduct uh, business with the town. So that concludes that introduction. Thank you, Town Administrator. <coughs> um, I'm not sure if you guys did a motion to read that in. I gave you the overview of it. I don't think we read the oh. summary. So do I motion? You're gonna, you want me to just make a motion? Yeah, you're good. Okay. I move that we uh, introduce ordinance uh, 2016-03 into the record. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? For Aye. consideration. Aye. 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 Passes. I have no more gas if somebody wants to read it. Perfect. Come on, Calvin. Keep man. You sure that's it? Yeah. I feel like I have cotton in my mouth. Mm. So if somebody wants to read that summary. Okay. It's up on the screen if you want. I have it. Uh, an ordinance of the Town of Rising Sun, Cecil County, Maryland, amending the general laws of the Town of Rising Sun by amending, restructuring, and adding language to Chapter 9 of the Code of Ordinances of the Town of Rising Sun in order to more clearly articulate the fiscal year budget process, special amendments, establishment of service fees, special assessment, late penalties for non-payment, sorry, should be yeah, non-payment, collections and tax sale procedures, and repealing any and all other ordinances and parts of the ordinances in conflict therewith. Thank you. Perfect. Next is citizens' input. Mr. Barr. The resolutions we did, the ordinances we read into record, and we'll set for to the next meeting in two weeks. No. The resolutions, not the ordinances. Yeah. Yeah, we, we didn't pass 01. We were going to consider it as an emergency ordinance. However, due to the fact that there's no snow schedule for the next 14 days, we didn't. <laughs> Mr. Barr, here, kid. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to uh, commend the uh, commissioners that uh, were out and about during the uh, big snowstorm. Uh, Dave, Alan, I don't know who else I missed, maybe, but uh, it's greatly appreciated. That's the plus side. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I always feel like every time I get up here, I'm the bad news bear from Valley View. You know, I always hear the complaints and everybody. But I, get you never, an outfit. <laughs> but I can never get anybody to come to me except what you see. But anyway, um, one of the, the three things I have all tie into to one subject of snow removal, ice removal. And I've heard some of the resolutions that have been adopted and, and, and the big thing is uh, we're looking at adopting new properties into, into the town. And we can't handle the ones we got, let alone add more to the, to the fire, uh, the way I see it. I mean, point being, this last snowstorm, we don't have the equipment or the manpower. And, and that, we don't have the contractors to do it either. And I understand they're locked up by the state and the county. Well, I, would, I would say a 30-inch snowstorm is pretty extraordinary. Well, yes, yes it is. Um, uh, the other point of, of that tie-in was the ice and the sidewalks. In this past ice storm, I don't know how you can enforce it uh, with people having their sidewalks cleared off when we weren't even out and about being salty, which created a lot of public safety. There was no salting in Valley View. I don't think, as I say, I don't think we actually got out because it was right, there was a none. fairly short-lived yeah. duration. I mean, it was... Yeah. It didn't start to ice over until about 6 a.m. Um, uh -huh. 
No, my, my grandson came down through an intersection at five o'clock in the evening and slid through the intersection. Nope, none. <coughs> Can, so. can, I, can I suggest this? For the most part, let me tell you how our guys get notified of ice and mm -hmm. snow uh, or icing conditions. Typically, it's done by the police department on patrol. Mm -hmm. If they go around and they find an issue, they will call our people in to either salt the entirety or a specific location. Mm -hmm. As a rule of thumb, we don't necessarily have our guys out all the time we because we are police on patrol they are the eyes and ears the other thing would be residents could call in because not all locations will ice over all the time so mm -hmm. if you have a situation like that in your particular development just mm -hmm. make a phone call and we'll who, have somebody who, who come in call after hours police department yeah but you can't have and no offense they're just on call maintenance number yeah I didn't okay. know that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And if not, call the police department and yeah. get someone eventually to stop and get a message. Okay. Yeah, I, I just feel like I'm the bad news bear here. There are, I mean, there are pluses to the town. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, I feel like I'm ready to move out with everything I've heard tonight. <laughs> I mean, it's like, and it's like you said, you know, you're going to penalize somebody and then turn around and lock them up and you're never going to get the money. That, and that, 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 being said, how can you penalize somebody? I mean, you find somebody and then and then turn around and put a penalty on top of it. If they can't pay the bill the first time, how are they ever going to pay the, the bill plus your fine? What, are you referring to the abatement penalty fees? Yeah, all these penalties I've heard during the night, yeah. <laughs> for, for various reasons, like, you know, that I've, that I've heard on different resolutions some of these resolutions can, for fines can i can i can i break let me give sure. you a, a little summary of it first of all you you have most of the violations are going to be something where there's a violation notice identified mm -hmm. and that, look you have things that are written in black and white in a code at times mm -hmm. but i think any good municipality will you know we're all human beings and we understand the issues and one of the most important things is communication so if we go up to a property and we've done this over and over that hasn't removed the snow and we find out it's someone that has a special circumstance they just got hurt or you know they're incapacitated or the the guy they normally have to come to do it didn't do it we're not standing there waiting for the opportunity to oh, issue yeah, a I fine on that. it we're yeah. going to work yeah. with people on that when it comes to the abatement where you get the much higher fines mm -hmm. we're typically talking about vacant properties or okay. we're talking about people that are absentee landlords that you know, we have people who live in Florida that still own property, and when the snow piles up and we call them, they're like, oh, I, I didn't know it was snow, and I thought I saw on the news, and here the town got 30 inches of snow. And they're making a business, because I always believe rental properties are a form of a business, because somebody's making money on that. Mm -hmm. The landlord is making money. And so they have an obligation to, to make sure that business has no more negative impact on the community than a Martin's or a McDonald's does. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to live out of the town of Rising Sun, three counties over, two states over, or the other side of the universe, and ignore your property to the point where you're coming out of your and falling on a sidewalk or something, that's, those are the people that we're targeting. Those, everybody else we have worked with and will continue to work with to resolve those things. Okay. We good? Okay. That's all I have. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Thank you. I don't have anyone else on the list. Would anyone else like to speak this evening? Okay. Some of the problem down as renters, I'm a landowner, some of the renters, some of the renters don't know the laws down there. They don't know about throwing the snow. Common sense. Some don't have common sense down there. No offense, but talking about the snow removal you're talking about the water first of all my sidewalks are sheets of ice because of the water that comes from the overflow pond all the way down that's still not that something needs to be done with that second of all 
I can clean my sidewalk off. The town comes in and puts 10 more inches back on. Because when they come down the street, they don't turn the plow away from the sidewalk. They put it all back on. So if I have to plow, uh, shovel it off, can I charge you guys for my time to do it? Being silly. But no, when they come down, instead of plowing it back on the sidewalks, could they possibly turn the plows away from it? So if the sidewalk's already plowed, I mean shoveled, I don't have to get it back out there and do it again. I mean, what, what I, first of all, we're very sensitive to that, and it would sound like an excuse. I, I would like, different conditions require different responses, and we talk to our guys constantly about trying to be as sensitive as they can to certain areas. There are some areas where we just can't avoid it, and I'm not suggesting your area is one where we can avoid it. But we also run into issues, and this is something that the board is considering with the purchase, actual purchase of new equipment, which goes to what Mr. Barr is referencing here. We, we're still removing snow in this community the way it was done 20 years ago, and, and we've joked about this. You get 30 inches of snow, maybe 20 years ago, and I say this in all due respect, some towns would say, we'll see you in a week and a half here. I mean, we pretty much had all our roads cleaned up by Monday of that storm. We were way ahead of what some of other agencies were doing. But there's all kinds of intangibles involved. Uh, I, I like, for instance, in your, in your particular development, we got hammered by people that were so upset that we didn't completely salt the upper area. Well, we're driving in a six-wheel dump truck, and when we come into some places, people you know, they come out of the woodwork in all of our developments. We had problems with kids playing in snowbanks, and so that made our guys really hesitant. We are sensitive to your concerns. We, are, we can improve in what we're doing, and we're not going to come down and cite you for or anybody else because we put snow on somebody's sidewalk. That's one of the things we had contractors do was dig out all the school bus locations because we knew we blocked in school bus locations. So we dug all that out. We dug out fire hydrants, although fire hydrants are the, technically the responsibility of the property owner, we still went and dug out all the fire hydrants in there. So my point is we're sensitive to it we're, and we'll continue to try to do a better job at and that. And I understand that and I do appreciate Mr. Warnick because I did, believe me, when you guys were out there taking the snow out, of the village. I do appreciate that. I really do. Um, but it's just, it's hard for me to get out there and, and, and do all that. Now, one snowstorm, I did talk to one of the town employees, and they, they did turn the plow away, and it was, it was great. But, you know. Also, dogs. Some of our neighbors are just taking, like, plastic clotheslines and tying their dogs up to their front porch and just letting them run on the line. Is that the right, I mean, can they do that <coughs> or do they need to be on leashes or how does that work? I don't have it in front of me, but we did pass a tethering law about three or four years ago. They talked about the tethering of animals and off the top of my head, I believe they can do it, but what they can't do is have a long enough tether line that gets the animal, I believe, within 10 feet of the property line. Because what we don't want, and you guys have a unique situation because you don't have much front in there, and that's another example of ordinances that, you know, communities try to make a one-size-fits-all and you have issues. But what we don't want is people minding their own business, walking down the sidewalk, and a dog on a leash comes flying at him, and they got to hope that leash holds or the dog is able to get up on the fence and be aggressive. That person panics, stumbles, slips off the sidewalk, and gets hurt. So our tethering, I'll have to look at it in more detail, but I'm pretty sure our tethering ordinance does allow that to be done. And what's the rule about pit bulls in town? Is there any, do they have to have special permits or anything yeah. like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because 
my neighbor and I are not going to get along with this dog. Because my issue is my dog's inside of a fence. I don't have him on a leash. I have a four-foot fence. But when they let the dog out and the dog comes over and then I ask them, please take care of the dog, I get this, I can't repeat it, you know, conversation that, you know, I need to take my dog inside my house. I don't think so. Well, let me suggest this. Regardless of the breed of dog, we don't, yeah, some communities have language regarding German Shepherds, Rottweilers, Pit Bulls. We don't have that. However, no dog, even if it's a teacup chihuahua, we have language that doesn't allow dogs to be openly aggressive to somebody. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, the police have that provision and we have that provision also. So if the issue is you have a dog that's getting real aggressive and, you know, inciting your dog or making people nervous, that's totally different. And that doesn't matter what breed of dog that is. We do have language prohibiting that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak tonight? Hearing none, we'll move forward, Chief. <coughs> um, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. <laughs> okay. Um, during the period of 9-16, um, February 9th, 2016 through February 23rd, 2016, we responded to 219 incidents. Um, since our last meeting, we had some significant incidents or uh, happenings that we had to deal with. One was Winter Storm Jonas. Um, as the residents have talked about and the commissioners have talked about, that brought a significant amount of snow to town. Um, we as a police department were fortunate we were able to continue providing services um, because of our maintenance guys, the state maintenance guys in the county that were out throughout the storm. Uh, we were able to continue to get around town. At some points, this storm delivered so much snow that it disabled quite a bit of the uh, of our services, the county services in the state. Um, for myself, being in law enforcement over 30 years, this is one of the worst events that I've worked in. And uh, we fared well because we did not have any crime trends like some other communities. Some other communities suffered burglaries, um, thefts, and so forth because of the inability to respond to uh, calls for service. Um, just prior to that storm, we did have a bank robbery here in town um, as a result of hard work from the members of the department and cooperation from the community. We were able to close that bank robbery shortly thereafter. I say shortly because nine days uh, is rather quick for some investigations to take place um, to get enough information to provide, you know, prefer charges. Uh, sometimes we've seen them, and I've personally had those that have gone on for quite some time, and uh, we finally make an arrest. We were able to do that quickly here with the help of the community. Uh, just prior to the snowstorm, we were able to commission our new vehicles. Um, we got them in a, probably a late December, early January, and finally got them on the street just prior to that snowstorm, which helped greatly for our officers to get around um, during that event. Uh, these are rather attractive in my opinion. They're very highly visible, 
and they they were very wealthy for us during that storm. Um, here's the bad part that we've experienced on February 10th was the loss of officers in Hartford County. They did have some ties to the officers here in our department. Um, last night we were able to pay our respects with the residents of the town. Uh, I'm glad that as many people showed up. I am thankful that the Board of Commissioners, the Mayor, and those responsible for this town were able to provide us with the outlet that we needed to say farewell. Many of the residents of this town are, are in law enforcement. Many of them are in emergency services, um, and they personally knew these two officers. Um, but the town did better than just speaking about these two officers. They went on to recognize and acknowledge the remaining 10 that, I'm sorry, the remaining eight that passed away um, recently. Okay, for uh, our selective enforcement areas, in Valley View, we've continued our patrols there. We're seeing, and the weather may be a, a help, but we're seeing a, not much going on there. We've written two citations. We've had six hours of patrol. Um, that's foot patrol. And uh, not much has been reported to us. Um, if there's something different, please see me, <laughs> and we'll see what we can get worked out. But you should be seeing a significant change in uh, some of the behavior in, in your community. For the West Main Street at Harrington Drive bus stop, um, we have are slowly scaling back because we appear to have changed human behavior. Behavior, I'm adding bees to word today for some reason. Um, but we spent 2.5 hours of uh, traffic monitoring. We were able to write two warnings that were not school bus related. Um, that appears to be coming under control also. In Brian's Grace, we uh, spent 10 hours of patrol, um, wrote three citations and three warnings. As you all know, we do spend a great deal of time at the middle school. With 8.5 hours of patrol, we've written 10 warnings for traffic violations as people enter and exit the school. Um, as a warning, residents should know that there are signs there directing traffic as to what directions you can go, but um, people tend not to pay attention to them. Uh, so we are enforcing them more and more um, as the officers are there for you know, school arrival and school dismissal. We've also spent 24 hours of DARE training in the school. Uh, throughout the town, we've had numerous arrests, one for theft, three for possession of heroin, uh, one fugitive from another area, one protective or order violation, the bank robbery, and we've had to uh, conduct one emergency evaluation. The emergency evaluations, you're going to start to see those rise because what I am being told is uh, there's no longer inpatient services where those suffering from, suffering from mental illness are going to be housed in a facility. They are being sheltered back in their own homes and provided medication, um, which means, you know, if they don't take their medication, they're going to uh, start to have problems. As far as the traffic, we've written 13 moving violations, three parking citations, and 72 warnings. And lastly, Shop with the Cop is set for March 19th. Coffee. Coffee, Coffee with the Cop. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm doing today. Coffee with the Cop is set for uh, March 19th, 2016, from 9 a.m. to 12. Lisa, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. At the cafe in March. Uh, that's why I'm telling you now. 
Are we straight, Lisa? Nothing, just going to tell you. I'm <laughs> telling you myself. And with that, that's my report, unless there are any questions, comments, or... Yes, sir. Chief, the, the arrest was at the PNC bank robbery? Yes, sir. And that, that person was apprehended? Yes, she was. Good job, because I know that uh, your sergeant had a lead on that very quickly. Um, I think you're being a little... was humble because they, they acted on that very quickly social media can play a very crucial role in an investigation um, just as well as the media if we get the information out there's still a great deal of good people out there that will help us the information went out quickly and just as quick as it went out it came back um, we were able to start looking in certain directions and it led us to what we uh, were able to apprehend. I, I, think, I think you were being very humble. I think you, you guys acted on that very quickly. Good yes. job. Because every time we get a bank robbery in this town, living right behind the bank, it makes me nervous as to this person may try to come hide out in our house or our yards or our basement ways. Yeah. So I thank understand. you for acting but, so quickly. <coughs> We've heard I, you said, what, nine days earlier to capture? It took nine days yeah. to capture. Well, we well it's worth noting there was a the blizzard in those nine days. Yes, exactly. <laughs> in between there, there was a blizzard. And you guys were doing <laughs> traffic detail with snow removal for, what, six of them? Uh, yes. So. Yes. But I, I don't want to seem like we're bragging or think that we're the best at what we do. Okay, I'll do it because, for you then. <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> be, because there's a great deal of great law enforcement in Cecil County. Um, if you hadn't noticed, and uh, some of you may have, I wear a 30-year pin. If you take a look at the officers that you have here in the department, they have pins on now that uh, will, you know, guide you to the longevity <coughs> of the officer. We have one that has five years. He's our newest guy. He has five years of experience. There's two with 30, uh, one with 20, and two with 15. We may be a small department. But we are a department that has a large amount of experience um, and a, a large facet of law enforcement. We do great with what we get, but our best asset is our relationship with the public. They are the ones that see and hear things that we don't. And if they didn't provide it to us, we would be Colombo still fumbling our way around until we found the answers. With social media today and our relationship with the, uh, the public that we serve, they get us information quickly. They get us some information that we don't even want to hear. Um, <laughs> things that we know about people that we really could care less, but they will provide us with everything we need. And we're grateful. Um, we're humbled because of it. And we will work from it. else you're laughing <laughs> oh, I, got I can tell you to color your socks without you shooting stuff at me it's yeah he has a bad habit of doing that thank you thank you town administrator do you have a report this evening uh, just to give you the financial numbers on the storm okay. um, as the chief highlighted we um, had the storm we were dealing with um, our personnel were basically in action from Friday um, until the following Thursday, for the most part. Um, the, we had 234 man hours spent during that time period. A variety of people, all hands on deck, different people running snow plows and shoveling and stuff like that. And then we had 234 hours of equipment operation also, so there's a lot of wear and tear. We had $20,000 uh, <clears throat> in total in salaries, during in-house salaries and overtime during that time period, $39,582 in contracted services. That's one thing the town of Rising Sun has taken uh, a position over the last couple of years is when we get these big snowstorms, 
we like to get out and actually physically remove the snow so that when we get a normal snowstorm a week later, there's no place to put the snow. So we get in and get very aggressive about it. So that cost us $39,582. For a total estimated cost of $59,582 to remove that snow from the town of Rising Sun. Again, I always like to give people their, their, their snapshot perspective. We collect $800,000 of real estate tax, so it cost us, just for that one week event, $60,000 of essentially unbudgeted money to get that snow out of here. Um, we have submitted all the proper forms and applications to uh, the county emergency services, which in turn will submit that to the state emergency management, which will in turn submit that to FEMA, and hopefully we can get at least a healthy percentage of that $59,000 back. <coughs> um, that concludes my report. Thank you, Town Administrator. All right. I don't think we have anything for Historical Preservation Commission. Uh, we also don't have anything for Arts Alliance tonight. Um, no old business that I know of. Do you? Does anyone have any old business? Um, I do have something for new business that was kind of a late arrival. I do apologize, gentlemen, for not having it on the agenda earlier. Uh, the town administrator is going to pull up this video. Um, one of the things that I think is really important, I'm going to stand why I do this, um, is communicating with our residents. We have, um, as a board, worked really hard in the past few years, especially working with social media on um, working with our residents um, and, you know, letting them know what's going on, um, transparency as far as, you know, letting them know about events, letting them know when there's a water main leak, whether there's some type of event that needs to happen. Uh, I, t I attended the uh, Maryland Mayor's Conference uh, earlier this month, and one of the things that really stuck with me was uh, this company that um, a lot of the municipalities and a lot of the mayors are using uh, right now. Um, this company is called Everbridge, and what Everbridge would do is, it is uh, what I'm asking the board to consider doing is uh, potentially getting a quote for the, from them. Uh, and we have a lot of um, elderly population in our town. Um, and you know, I spoke with the mayor of Chesapeake City, and one of the things that Chesapeake City does is they call all their residents. They only have 600 people though. We have 3,000 people um, in the town of Rising Sun Plus. Um, Everbridge would actually provide it so that um, you could tell who, what is the best way for communicating with our residents. If they're an older person and they don't have social media, let's consider um, calling them on the phone and leaving a, a detailed message of, hey, we have this water main break, or hey, you know, we're doing movies in the park, um, or we're having this town event. It just gets communication out further, um, especially for an older person that you know doesn't have Facebook, isn't able to, to get on social media. Um, you know, they're able to do that for someone that may not have social media, but they have email. Um, Everbridge can send a communication through email, letting them know that hey, this is what it is. They also offer a text messaging service very similar to Nixel. Um, this is a short video that I'm going to let you guys see for a second, and then I'll finish the presentation. So you keep talking while we were getting the car. <laughs> Citizens have different needs for services. You are unique, and just like you, the citizens in your community are unique too. This diversity makes your community special, but it also means that your citizens have different needs for services, assistance, and communication during an emergency. Everbridge helps you identify and communicate with all of the individuals in your community, helping you reach citizens, staff, and emergency personnel with the right messages at the right time on the devices they use the most. This is an Everbridge city, a city with the flexibility to deliver unique messages to its residents at just the right time a city that can deploy resources precisely when and where they are needed, a city that can respond to events, whether severe weather, crime, or missing persons, with unmatched speed and accuracy. Real-time data, 
social media and threat feeds, weather alerts, and visual data from on-the-scene mobile users, create situational intelligence about events as they develop. An interactive map shows precisely where the crisis is unfolding and where people and property are located, enabling local resources to respond more effectively. Everbridge provides state and local governments with a unified critical communication suite that helps you be better prepared, make better decisions, and respond quickly and confidently during disruptive events, ultimately helping you protect life and property and improve your response during critical events. Want to learn more? Visit everbridge.com. This is also something that uh, was, was really cool for me to learn. Um, say we have a development. Um, you know, it could be Ryan Drive, it could be Valley View. Um, we could actually section it off just to notify those residents. So we could say, um, hey, we're just notifying the residents of Valley View of their outage or whatever it may be. And what Everbridge would do is they would send out those notifications, whether the person signed up for an email alert, whether they signed up for a telephone alert, or whether they signed up for a text message. Um, I just think that it is a better way to communicate with our residents. We continue to evolve with communication and with transparency um, for our residents. This is just another, as our town administrator always likes to say, another tool in the tool shed that's a possibility. Um, I think that um, especially with social media, it's, it's a great thing that we have Facebook, but a lot of people have told me not everyone has Facebook, you know. So a great way to communicate, especially with that elder population, is to call, um, is to leave that voice message. You know, um, we, we talked about uh, a water outage. You know, we can leave that voicemail message. If somebody doesn't pick up, it's an automated <coughs> message. Basically, what it would allow is the system would allow the town administrator or our police chief or even our Parks and Recreation Commissioner, if he had an event to do, to basically record a message, hit a button, and it automatically calls all those people on the list. Um, it's something very simple. It takes about 30 minutes, they said, to call about 200 people. Um, so they just call and leave a detailed message and say, this is what it is. If it's an email, same thing. You just hit it out, and all those people that have signed up for an email, it'll send it out to all of them. Um, like I said, it's just something that um, I would like to see if someone would be willing to give a motion that maybe we could instruct the town administrator to get pricing on this system um, and just to look into it further. So, we need thank a motion you. to instruct you to get pricing. So would, would you gentlemen be okay with moving forward yep. with looking at pricing for something yes. like this? I think before we just do pricing, we ought to get other information too. Okay. Because uh, when it comes to any kind of disaster, of course, more communication and notice would be good. So if you could bring us, you know, prices of what it's looking at, along with more information about the service and the length of contracts and stuff, I think yeah, that would be a good idea. Typically what, what – um, the mayors have done in the past when I spoke to them is they've had their administration department instruct and they've come back with a detailed report. Hey, this is our packet. This is how much it'll cost. Who else is using it right now? Um, the town of Del Mar. Um, the town, uh, I have the list at home. I can certainly bring it. It's about four or five different towns and they range in size. I would say the smallest is about 1,500 residents. Um, and then you have the larger communities. Salisbury is one of them. They use it. Um, Salisbury has many, many residents. So. Um, yeah. Sounds like a good program. I'd just like to speak to those and absolutely see, and not something we just jump right well, into. The, but the save Calvin time, I can give them a call. Yeah, absolutely. And I can research it. That would be great. That's no problem. Um, I just think, like I said, with with us evolving many years ago, you know, I spoke to someone that was um, a town commissioner years and years ago, and he said, you know, you guys are doing great with Facebook with letting people know what's going on because when we had to turn the water off, we just turned it off. He said we didn't notify anyone. You know, in, in that day and age, we just turned it off and you didn't have any water when you turned it on and that was it. Um, and now um, we have this age of Facebook, but for those people that don't have Facebook, let's move and evolve and potentially see how else we can inform them. And I'm sure there's other vendors like that. Uh -huh. Maybe they'll find some yeah, competitive absolutely. vendors. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of products out there like Avaya that you yeah. does. So. <laughs> absolutely. Across the board of looking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think it would be good to do um, a bid spec and see, you know, if we would get any bidders back or something like that. But first, 
let's let Commissioner Lashier maybe by the next meeting. Is that cool? Yeah, that's fine. If you could get some more information about it. I um, can reach out. That would be great. All right. Uh, moving forward, um, do you want to go over the town office hours, Calvin? Or are they just listed? Uh, just We've been listing next holiday and next holiday is Good Friday on March 25th. Um, one of the things we, now I'm taking you to, I didn't realize what you were asking me there. Um, as you know, we um, received a resignation from uh, the office manager, Marsha Spencer, and as a result, um, as part of our reorganizing and being short-staffed, we're going to go back to what the town used to do. Prior to me being here, um, I was told the town used to close for lunch between 12 and 1. So for a little bit of time period here, we're going to be closed for uh, foot traffic uh, from 12 to 1. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda is my report. My report's pretty brief, although we did have a few things. We did miss three meetings, um, so I just wanted to go over. First and foremost, I wanted to thank uh, the board, uh, the state championship volleyball team. At the last meeting that I wasn't here, um, I was presenting proclamations to them. Uh, it went over very well, um, and a lot of, uh, a lot of the um, parents commended us for the relationship that we have started with our school system, especially with the high school. Um, this was the first time that a sports team was actually given proclamations from the town of Rising Sun. Um, and, you know, Rising Sun High School represents our name. So they thought that that was pretty great. Um, and uh, they really wanted to thank you for uh, your support. Um, and uh, we look forward to um, potentially, you know, going together as a board to some of the sports games. Last, I would say, uh, maybe a year ago, we went to the football game, the homecoming football game, together as a group. I think it would be great to go to another sporting event at some point in time together just to show our support to the high school. Uh, I also mentioned that I did attend the Maryland Mayor's Conference. It was great to uh, meet with colleagues and talk with them about what was going on in their communities and uh, share a little bit about our uh, wonderful town here. Uh, I also uh, attended a great seminar on social media. Uh, they had a gentleman come, and, and to be honest with you, if he wasn't so expensive, I would say bring him here so we, he could speak to us about it. Um, because uh, he just had some great advice as far as uh, interacting with your residents on social media, what's important in this day and age, um, and you know, moving forward into the future, what is going to be more important. Uh, I also wanted to say uh, I will be starting my first uh, Mayor for the Day visit um, in the upcoming next week. Uh, the Tome School will be the first school that I attend. Um, believe it or not, the Tome School is actually in Northeast. Um, and I told them, you know, this is uh, Mr. McKnight's uh, territory. He's the mayor of Northeast. Uh, but apparently, um, due to my age, they want to have another perspective. So they would like to have the kids come and see me there. So I went last year. Um, the kids really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed myself. After the Tome School, I plan on attending uh, Conowingo Elementary, uh, as well as Rising Sun, and then possibly Calvert Elementary to do uh, mayor for the day. I've already spoke with the chief about how we're going to, uh, you know, do another um, mayor for the day contest for the kids locally so that they can also participate and potentially win a local prize of uh, spending the day with me, having lunch, um, checking out uh, the town of Rising Sun. Uh, I also wanted to say uh, a huge thank you um, to our public work staff for all of their hard work. Um, not only with putting up uh, the blue lights that you see throughout our community, but also we did have a major water main leak um, in our Main Street area, and they responded very well. Um, it was amazing to me that we have such a proactive elected body as well. Um, within minutes of getting notified of it, um, I was there, Commissioner Lashier was there, and Commissioner Warnick was there. Um, so uh, we were there and checking out the leak and, uh, you know, talking with Public Works, um, and, you know, it was pouring the snow. I mean, this was right in the middle of the blizzard. So um, it was amazing how proactive that these gentlemen are, especially with their prospective departments. Um, I did want to say a thank you to Chief Peterson, to Rising Sun PD. I'm sure Commissioner Shepard will cover this, but also to Commissioner Shepard, um, Commissioner Warnick, who worked behind the scenes, to our town administrator and his wife, um, as well as Becky Warnick, uh, for all of their hard work on our police vigil last night. Um, it was very well attended. Um, you gentlemen should be commended uh, for your work on this. Um, 
And I think that the one thing that was um, overwhelming to me especially, you see a photo that was taken and I'm in the background of Sheriff Gaylor and um, I'm right at that moment of potentially uh, losing it, of getting very upset. Um, and just the emotionalness of this past week, um, I just think it was great to have that outlet for our community um, and for some of our officers there to be able to come. So uh, thank you for all your hard work on that. Uh, that will conclude my report. Um, I'm going to move forward into commissioner comments. Commissioner Alton Reith. There's a, there's a lot to cover <clears throat> since we haven't met since back in January, and I'm probably going to miss some things. Um, first and foremost, I want to mention the planning upcoming planning board meeting because of the Martin Luther King holiday on the 15th, which would have been our regular scheduled meeting. We'll be meeting this Monday, the 29th. And I'm going to say 6.30 p.m. Um, one of our members is an accountant, and it's tax time. So uh, we're hoping that 6.30 p.m. Uh, will work for us that night. Uh, one other thing I want to mention uh, is um, one of our uh, members who's been a former mayor, commissioner, planning board member, Rising Sun Historical Preservation uh, Committee, a uh, man that's been uh, involved in this town uh, very deeply uh, is having some health issues. So everybody remember Tom Mummy uh, and, and wish him a, a speedy recovery. Uh, he's uh, been under the weather and uh, I won't go into his personal issue, but uh, Tom's dedicated his life uh, here in Rising Sun to all the boards and committees he served on. So let's, let's not forget about Tom. <clears throat> as far as streets and sidewalks, a couple things um, I'll go over is condition and safety. Um, with, the, with the storms and everything we've had, you know, all the projects that we've had going on with <clears throat> our streets and sidewalks for the winter have kind of been on hold. We were able to get Ryan Drive stabilized for the winter uh, just in time. Uh, and we'll be revisiting that. Uh, Cal and I were just talking about sometime in late March. Uh, but we're going to see what winter brings with its last punch coming here in the month of our, uh, March and see how our conditions come up. Uh, I think Ron Thomas and the guys and our contractors that did the work to remove snow did a, a great job quickly with very minimal damage um, to, to the area. And I think that has to do with everybody being out. I know Dave spent a lot of time out there, and that's why he's sick all the time, because he's always outside in this bad weather, um, you know, helping direct and see what's going on. And we trucked a lot of snow out of here. I wish we could have got some money. We could sell snow to Eskimos or something. So <laughs> we'd, we'd been put that on our fee schedule. But, yeah, they, they did a good job, and they, we could do better. Big snow like this, we learned, and, you know, we – we were out there plowing out our driveways after we had just plowed everything, and that daggone town guy came down and plowed us back in, you know, too. So, Brenda, you weren't alone. <laughs> and, uh, but, it, you know, that comes with a, a big snowfall like that. And, um, you know, the icing, uh, Bill, I was one of the guys got out there that Monday and shoveled his driveway just in time to turn the sidewalk and driveway into an ice skating rink last Monday. Man, I felt so dumb when I did that. <laughs> Because Dave and I were standing there talking as the rain was coming down, and it was like we were scared to move, you know. So, and, and you know, it's That's things like that 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 we 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 learn from our mistakes and and, and what we can do. So we've talked about investing in some equipment uh, because in ten years that I've been in Rising Sun, we've had you know several major snowstorms, and it's not like they're once every ten years; they're coming every couple of years now. So we're looking at investing in some equipment and, you know, more manpower, you know, and how we can do a better job. Uh, yeah. Big articulating loader that we can move a lot of snow with, bigger dump truck, you know, a different type of backhoe. And uh, so there's um, – so I'm going to go on record that you approved that, okay? What? All that good equipment we're going to purchase. So, But, yeah, we need to get some more equipment and, and – uh, so, you know, it's going to happen again, but I think they did a great job of getting out there. And fortunately, like I said, it happened on a weekend. They were able to clear the area, and uh, everybody got back out. And, Chief, I, I think it was, even with as bad as the snow was, it was a pretty safe event. We didn't have any major uh, problems. I know a couple of our emergency personnel got stuck getting out helping people. But when you got weather like that, stay off of it. So, And, and as far as the safety of our streets, you know, they – 
that ties into the condition. We've got a pretty safe community here of streets and sidewalks. And uh, after we cleared out everybody that's, you know, still here and living and not a vacant home, they went back and, and moved a lot to create a safe passageway right down by Harrington, that, that house down there. You know, there was <coughs> a lot of snow there right by Harrington Body Shop. There's a vacant home just up from it that we had to clear a ton of snow. Yeah, coming up this way. So there's a lot of vacant places they got to clear. So um, like I said, as, as we get through this next month, we'll start evaluating what happened. We'll be meeting with KCI to go over a report that they gave us on all the roads and see what, what may have happened. And like I said, so far the information coming in is we didn't get a lot of damage. We've come through this so far pretty good. One, one water main leak, you know, right out here. And, and hopefully as the ground starts transferring over to spring next month, we'll see if anything else happens. But I think we came through this so far pretty good this year after having two right out here back to back in front on Queen Street last year. So, um, you know, <laughs> thanks, Bill. So, uh, you know, and, and just like with what uh, the mayor was saying, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Shepard, Commissioner Warnick, the chief, town administrator, Ron Thomas, and uh, our public works guys for all the work they did last night uh, putting on the event to honor and respect um, our fallen officers. And one thing that, um, you know, I did notice, Chief brought it up, we have a lot of emergency services and, and law enforcement people that were out in that crowd last night, not in uniform, out there with their kids, their grandkids, teaching them to respect the law enforcement officers and, and, and what they do. So we want to thank Sheriff Gaylor and his staff for coming over and Chip Slayball for speaking last night. Uh, Travis, your pastor's name again. Josh Phillips. Josh Phillips for coming and speaking. So as we transition from remembering and respecting these officers who watch ended, let's give the same respect uh, to those who are still on watch, to the chief and his staff who are out there every day protecting us from the bad guys through this tragedy and um, how they continued to do their job after that happened um, is, is just, uh, it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite an act of bravery for lack of, you know, they've had the word hero tossed around, but uh, what they did was nothing more than heroic. So. Let's, let's remember all these officers on this wall and uh, the ones that are still on watch and uh, keep them safe. And they're out there keeping your streets and sidewalks safe and your community safe. And thanks for everybody for coming out last night. I was so happy to be part of it. And all the, you know, for Sheriff Gaylor coming across the river to meet with us and bringing his staff, the county executive and Scott Adams for coming. Really, uh, rising sun shined last night. Uh, you know, showed showed our commitment to those uh, blue lives out there. With our police breakfast that was started by Commissioner Scully, carried on this year by Commissioner Shepard. I uh, was really proud to be part of that last night. So, uh, just wanted to mention that, and uh, that's all I have tonight, Travis. Thank you, Commissioner this year. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll try and be very brief. <laughs> um, last, <laughs> I just have a couple quick things. I mean, why not? Yeah, um, it's been so long since we met Ron. Those guys did a great job during the the snow removal process. I mean, you know, they were definitely all over the place. And I know we beat the county by more than a day in clearing streets. And uh, as far as uh, everything that was put together last night, I really didn't do any effort with that. But I mean. You know, it was really humbling to be there, and I mean, you guys really did a fantastic job putting everything together. You know, it was it was very very nice. And as far as the end of, of water and sewer, just real quickly, I mean, I know Calvin's been with the meetings with Chester Water because that's ongoing to, uh, for the Susquehanna River Basin. There's we've been having a lot of talks with MDE, and we also had at least one meeting here with Chester Water, just trying to work and come to terms on a contract. And Mr. Mayor, that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Lashier. Commissioner Shepard. Okay. Um, I have very little to talk about now. So everybody already. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We'll just go back over it again. So, um, first and foremost, I want to thank um, everybody's support for last night. 
all the citizens who came out. Um, I don't think we could have provided a better gift to Harford County Sheriff's Office and, and to our police department and the allied agencies in Cecil County and around. Um, just everyone being there uh, just proves how pro-police we are, how we support these guys day in and day out and, and everything that they do. Um, I do want to publicly uh, just offer our condolences to the Harford County Sheriff's Office, um, mainly because I know this is going to be taped. So if anybody watches this, it's just a public statement from us. So um, we appreciate Sheriff Gaylor and his command staff coming out last night. Um, we really wanted to uh, to do this for them and, and also, like I said, all the other law enforcement um, around us. A um, couple people I would like to thank for last night. Um, first and foremost is Chip. Um, Chip does a good job of organizing um, people. Um, he got a lot of people uh, ready for last night, got a lot of people involved for last night. Um, so I just want to uh, give him a shout out. Um, also, Dave Warnick. Um, if you were there last night, I don't know if you saw it out of the corner of your eye, Dave was going crazy, trying to get everything up, make sure it was in the right order, yelling at me because I was doing things wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hopefully nobody saw that and it was seamless, um, but I noticed it and, and, and Dave always keeps me on track. Um, so I, w I just want to say thank you to him. Um, next is Calvin, um, just for, for being the backbone and, and supporting everything we do. Uh, some of the crazy ideas that we had that he kind of <laughs> talked us off of because it was just nuts. And then some of the ideas that he was like, yeah, I think that's doable. And, and we pulled it off. So um, two people I want to thank, too, is uh, Pam Haynes for taking all those crazy ideas and, you know, kind of bringing them to fruition, and, and uh, Terry Bonnenberger also. Um, she was a huge help. Um, she found the uh, LED blue balloons, which I never even thought they made, which was pretty amazing. So um, I would like to thank uh, County Executive Terry Moore for coming out. Um, I saw uh, Wayne Tome. I'd like to thank him for coming out. Um, our sheriff, Scott Adams, and like I said before, uh, Harford County Sheriff uh, Jeff Gaylor and his command staff, and, and um, Josh Phillips, especially, uh, from Pleasant View Baptist Church, um, <coughs> and really all the allied agencies that, that had somebody here. Um, you know, I appreciate them coming and, and taking the time to do that, but we wanted to do that for them too. So it was a little bit of give and take. They came and, and we thanked them. So um, uh, that's basically where I'm going to leave it. So thank you. Oh, public works. Okay. Public works on call number, <laughs> Chip has given me, uh, is 410 658 6475 for. Um, after hours issues so there you go <laughs> thank you commissioner warnick uh i'm gonna i have a couple things i'm gonna go over um i'm trying to keep it fairly brief though uh going back to i guess the uh, snow removal i mean the the uh we pushed everybody really hard during that event and um i mean there were a lot of frazzled nerves there was you know some yelling at each other and such that went on and um, some dealing with angry motorists and such. And uh, it was an interesting event, but I, I, I mean, really appreciate it. Even uh, Commissioner Lashier was out, you know, and I were out, you know, shoveling town hall and um, Commissioner Althreath was, you know, yelling at me for playing in traffic and, you know, keeping us all safe. And I had my safety vest on. Safety I'm vest. just putting that out there. In the car. Reflective vest was on. <laughs> I think it may only be a class two rather than a class three, but we'll I had or, maybe I'll add some more stripes to it to make it a class three. And then uh, it may not be uh, green, but it was orange. Yeah. <laughs> so, but then uh, Commissioner Shepard and we were uh, dealing with uh, Wilson Avenue and not in front of his house. We didn't. Um, and uh, <laughs> you know, keeping keeping traffic out of the way. But um, uh, no. So it was it was. Uh, 
quite an effort, and, and uh, everybody really put a lot of work in, and there were a lot of tired people. At, at Grant, we had to make him leave a couple times. Um, we practically had to drag some of our public works guys out of town. They just didn't want to, they just wanted to keep clearing snow. So, um, And at midnight, I think one night we decided we were in a neighborhood removing snow and maybe the neighbors wouldn't be too happy about all the scraping and noise at midnight. So, uh, so anyway, April 9th, oh, I should also mention last weekend, the Rising Sun Arts Alliance had their sit and, sit and stitch um, and uh, it was well attended. I unfortunately was out of town that weekend and was able to make it, but I believe there was somewhere around 30 to 40 people that showed up. I'm not sure if it, but I mean, it was definitely well over 20. I mean, 20 to 30. It could have been as many as four people. So we're going to go with fishermen's on. 30 to 40? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, Calvin well, was there. He didn't get the official yeah. count. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, they had the entire section full. Yeah, they filled up the yeah. coffee area there at Martin's. So um, I gathered that was very well attended and uh, um, was Apparently it was a fairly good time. I think. Did you do any stitching? I did. did just not. sit. I I made fun of Calvin. Yeah, so Calvin you just did a lot of yeah. sitting and Calvin okay. made some cool little comments. <laughs> there we go. Um, parks and Rec were starting to thaw out. Uh, we will have uh, the snow mountains probably until July, so uh, it'll be sledding in the town of Rising Sun probably well in the summer. Um, but the Next event we have at this point, we believe, will be April 9th, is a Project Stream cleanup at Triangle Park. I don't know that we're going to be able to clean up Triangle Park because there may still be too much snow and mud there, so we may have to move that to Veterans Park. But at this point, we're planning for Triangle Park, and we'll have to just wait and see what the weather beholds there. Uh, if it gets warm enough to get rid of the snow, then maybe we can clean that up. Um, we believe there will be car parts over at Veterans Park, so if you find those, um, you can, you know, in the parking lot, just let us know and we'll try and keep those cleaned up. There was a car that burned up on uh, Pearl Street and while we were plowing, we realized after we had started to move the snow that we had plowed up a bunch of parts and we are just dumping them in the dump truck and they got dumped down at Veterans Park. So hopefully we'll get those cleaned up as the snow melts. Um, but just be aware of that as, as you're down there that, you know, there may be some sharp objects in that pile of snow. Uh, and with that, I think I'll just go ahead and conclude my report. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot. I have this letter sitting here in front of me. Um, one the actually really good piece of news for the town of Rising Sun is uh, we have been designated a sustainable community as of nice. October 25th, uh, 21st, 2015. We got notified, uh, I guess, over the last couple of weeks. Um, yeah, well, I think it was about, it was like last Wednesday we found out. So, uh, but anyway, or I guess it was January, somewhere, it doesn't matter. Um, we found out we've been designated a sustainable community, so we're going to start applying for uh, grants. We're looking at um, a grant possibly for additional parking area uh, in the center of town and uh, possibly some f facade improvement grants and things like that. So we're, um, we're going to start looking through grant programs and seeing what's out available out there for us to apply for, and we're going to, you know, get our pencils sharpened and, and get stuff submitted. So with that, I conclude my report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's great news, Commissioner Warnick. Uh, I also wanted to commend the board. Uh, one of the things that you may not have been able to see is the communication that we all have had, um, especially during winter storm Jonas. Uh, we all stayed um, fairly communicated uh, together. We had some conference calls. We all spoke together. Um, so it was just great to see a board come together and be able to speak together and, and uh, you know, um, work together for the benefit of our community. Uh, with that being said, could I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Then moved and seconded all in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. <laughs>